People and Music on Energy Groove. Today I'm joined on the phone in New Zealand by Mike Chun, former member of Split Ends and Citizen Bands, former director of New Zealand Operations for the Australasian Performing Right Association, also known as APRA, and current CEO of Play It Strange. Welcome to the program, Mike. Hi, Brad. How are you? I'm wonderful. Good to be here. Now, tell us, we'll start uh, uh, talking about Play It Strange, um, which is a charitable trust um, that you established in 2003, I believe. Yes. Um, and that has the purpose of encouraging young New Zealanders to develop interest in skills in songwriting and musical performance. Um, now, from what I understand, you had a, a quite an early start um, in music uh, at an early age. Was this one of the driving forces behind starting Play It Strange? Yes. I guess what you're saying is, is it a vicarious pursuit? I guess it is in a way, because when I grew up, in the, I, was there, I was lucky enough to be at boarding school from 1966 to 1970, which would be, and will be, I mean, there's probably five glorious years of a contemporary music scene mm. where young people were writing, performing and recording songs that we all got to hear around the world, but it changed to such a degree in that period of time that we were completely swept up in it. And so Tim Finn and I at boarding school sort of trapped inside the four walls of that school. Mm -hmm. To us, the Beatles was a complete and utter spotlight uh, which said, follow us. But of course, New Zealand in those days was devoid of any understanding of songwriting or performance or recording. And so we just imagined and dreamed about these things. So it wasn't until we left school that we pursued it. Meanwhile, at school, if you wanted to be an All Black, there were all these infrastructures in place, all the support structure, you didn't have to do anything to buy a pair of boots, mm. but principally you had to want to be a good rugby player. And Tim and I did that, and we ended up in the first 15. I thought, when I was at APRA, I thought, all I'm doing, which is not a down, I'm not saying this in a down kind of way, but I'm talking to people who are 20 plus. Everybody is 20 plus. Why, where are the teenagers? Why aren't the songs being written at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15? And they probably were. I suspected they were because I remember Neil Finn writing when he was 16 and all that kind of thing. And so I, I thought let's start a school program based around principally songwriting because it's not a subject. In fact, very few countries in the world, if any, have songwriting as a part of the curriculum. But in the meantime, let's go looking for the great songs that these young people are writing. And after 12 years, we found many, many, many great songwriters hiding away in schools. Yeah, I, I find it odd that music and, uh, I guess, creative uh, subjects are almost an afterthought in primary and kind of intermediate schooling. I think that's because a typical music teacher, and I don't want to come across like I'm dumping on them, but if you look at the path they follow, so they go to secondary school, take music as a subject, in which composition is a subject, and all the other, one, other ones that go with it. But there's a lot of quotes and quavers, and a lot of references and performances of songs, or sorry, not songs, of instrumental pieces written by classical composers. Songs tend to end up in choirs, so there's a strong choral bent uh, in secondary schools. But when they then go to university and take a BMUS, Bachelor of Music, mm. again, songwriting is not part of what they're doing. Then they come around and they start teaching. So I think a typical music teacher tends to have not written a lot of songs, played them at gigs, gone up and down the country playing at shows, or made records that have been released commercially. And yet, every single living human being in, the, in your country and mine Here's a recorded song, how many times a day? Ten? How can you not live and not witness with your ears and then, to varying degrees, your heart and your mind to respond to those songs? We all have favourite songs that we will actually carry with us lovingly till we die. And yet, at schools, there isn't this infrastructure to actually have a go at writing them. And that's my dream, is that one day, the principal of the school stands up and says, well, we've, uh, we've had some great songs written in the last month and we posted them up here and you make sure you all listen to them. And also the first have been lost on Saturday, but we don't care too much about that. People and Music on Energy Groove.
Play It Strange runs a number of programs across New Zealand too to foster the musical talents of young people. Tell us about some of the programs that, that Play It Strange runs currently. Well, so, it started with songwriting. Mm. And so we have a national songwriting competition. We get about, at the moment, 350, 400 songs sent in voluntarily from all over the country. And we whittle them down. Jordan Luck from The Exponents, who's, I think he's written more top 20 songs than any other New Zealander in this country, is the head judge. And we whittle it down to about 40. And then we invite them because of, you know, they don't have to go, but they all run to them, mm. to go to professional studios to record. So in the main, they've been going to Neil Finn's Roundhead Studios here in Auckland, okay. where they put them down with a lot of excitement and uh, very, very involved in seeing their song, which starts out as maybe just the piano and the voice or a guitar and a voice, not much else, actually turning into a masterpiece because we have engineers and people have helped them put their songs into arrangements and that in the studio. And that album then goes, gets posted online and we make about 3,000 CDs. We give each songwriter about 25 CDs to give to parents and aunts and uncles and everybody. And what do you what do you find the, the students take out or take away from that experience of recording yeah, music? Well, the word they use, I was on the radio station here recently with this, the songwriter, Grace Wood, and the, you know, the interviewer said to Grace, what is it about this when you record them and then people start to hear it? She said, I feel completely empowered. I feel that my gentle, she used insecurity as to whether or not I'm any good as a songwriter is completely banished and I feel confident and ready to start writing more and more and to record them because the feedback I'm getting from my recorded song is incredible. I use sport as an analogy because in New Zealand, say rugby, of course, as you know, is incredibly well entrenched and very sophisticated in its infrastructures through school. And every Saturday, there's a field, there's paint around the outside of the field, there are goalposts, there's a referee, there's a whistle, someone keeps the score. But as a player, you don't have to be involved in any of that. You don't have to mow the lawn of the field, you just get on that field and pursue the craft of playing the game. And in my mind, that's what it should be like for a songwriter, performer. Write the song, have it heard, get feedback, guidance, mentoring. I don't think you teach songwriting. And then we will, like I have the equivalent of a high performance academy, and we'll invite in those top 40 songs that have been listened to over and over and over again because we don't just listen to a song and decide that that's one that should be recorded. Jordan and I in the final stages would have them for three to four weeks going round and round and round. And so, yeah, it's like having a beautiful football field to play rugby on when they go into the studio and they and they really, really shine. Tell us a little bit about more of the process of, I guess, the judging of the songs. What are, What are you looking at? We judge the lyrics and the music 50-50. So we always start with the words. And even just reading them is quite a revelation. I mean, we have a lyric award, for example, and it's, the opening lines are incredible. Um, well, I could go on for hours about the words that some of these kids write. There are generalizations. Of the females tend to wear their hearts on their sleeves. Last night we had our award show where we have different awards and each winner receives the award and then sings the song but the winner of the lyric award recited hers. Well, you could hear a pin drop in the room. Basically, it starts off, my mother told me, you are what you eat. And so I eat flowers, hoping I'm going to be beautiful. Flowers are beautiful. And then she goes on this road where in the end, the flowers actually are dead. And this incredible lyric. So, yeah, so we, we focus very much on the lyrics. So you can't do yummy, 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 I've got love in my tummy and, and end up on our CD, really. Then not. there's the music. Well, the music, there are different genres of music. They're not thinking, oh, will, you know, Top 40 Radio play me? They're not thinking, will I get gigs up and down the country? They just want to say something. What, what are some of the common themes that you see being, uh, I guess, written about? from that age group, I, su I suppose it would be quite different to someone who was, you know, quite more established in the industry writing a, a song. 
Yeah, well, they're naked. So I could recite some. There was a song called Angel, written by a 14 year old girl, which read, I know a lady sweeter than a baby, but unwanted by her own. And we were lucky. At the bottom of the lyric sheet, she wrote, This song is a plea to my parents to stop treating my grandmother who lives with us so badly. And I went to the studio where she was recording it. My son actually was playing guitar on it because, mm. as she said, I'm, not, I'm no good on guitar. <laughs> and she's singing it away, and her father was sitting in the control room. And I walked into the control room, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and we actually didn't say anything. But all over his face it was written, I will be a better man. So I think a lot of these songs have a purpose behind them, allowing them to say things that they would never say. It's a great window into the hearts and minds of these young people. Energy Groove and Music Matters presents People and Music. When you were that age, what got you into music? At what point did you realise that this was the path that you wanted to take? Two things. One, my focus on songs started when we used to have young woman that lived with us and there were, you know, there was the terrible old days when from small towns would come pregnant women you know that whole thing have babies and go back home again oh, right. they lived they lived with us and they were always in a small room on the other side of my wall so i would lie in bed at the age of seven now that's 1959 yeah and i would hear something like um I hear the cotton woods whispering of Tammy by D.B. Mm. Well, I just got these songs all started feeding into my head. But really, it wasn't until I was 12 and I went to see A Hard Day's Night. And that was a complete start of a overwhelming focus on contemporary pop music, thanks to the Beatles. And then being in boarding school, because they're so trapped in there, you weren't allowed outside the gates. You couldn't go home on the weekends or anything like mm. that. So we just played what started out being Beatle Records. Revolver was the one that really, 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 really dominated my life. And then Jimi Hendrix and then The Who and The Cream and all that. So, yeah, we, we were donors. We were, everything else about our lives in that school was very forgettable, apart from playing rugby. Uh, but when Tim and I left school, we were going to be Beatles. So you used music as an escape? Very much so, mm-hmm. to this day. I, and also, I've been lucky to, to join bands, well, two, basically, where there were great songwriters. And, you know, I got to play in Chicago and Perth and Bristol and Aberystwyth. And I got around the world. And so those 10 years of being a player... It was like going to another crazy, wonderful, colourful planet. I didn't come out with a dollar in my back pocket, but I wouldn't change anything for the world. Let's talk a little bit about that. You, you played bass for Split Ends uh, for a number of years in the early 70s. Tell us about that experience and how, how did that start for you? How did, well, you, le- how did you learn bass? Oh, the bass. Why the bass? I think it's completely tied into my personality. I wanted to buy a bass when I was listening to... Revolver, because I wanted to be a Beatle. I wanted to be one of those guys. Mm-hmm. I wanted what they had. And But I also immediately thought I want to play the bass. I think it's because my personality is I can't stand being isolated. Like, I never play solo sports. I've never played tennis. I've never played golf. I've always been in teams. And I think I play the bass because I don't want to have to do anything alone on the stage. Like, if someone like Tim said to me, oh, why don't you come in with a few lines on your own? I'd say, no, I don't do that. Why don't the drums and I play together on that piece or something? So I'm a team player. I'm probably quite insecure, but I love showing off. <laughs> a lot of that was... And also maybe the bass didn't look complicated, even though McCartney was playing stuff that was just completely unreal. But when I play the bass, I don't feel that I... It, it's not actually that, that, that difficult compared to... I look at the drum, I, you know, I look at Paul Crowder and Spinez, and I think, well, it's all pretty tricky. And Eddie Rainwald, of course, he's the magician, and I could never do that. And I look at Tim out front, and I think, well, I could never do that. And Phil Judd, the songs he wrote were just incredible. Those early days when he would come through with songs like Stranger Than Fiction, Time mm-hmm. for a Change, Lovey Dovey, For You, all those early end songs. It was 
unbelievably exciting. You know, there's a word we all use quite a lot, but we shouldn't. Uh, joy, joyous. Mm. It was probably one of the most joyous periods of my life, with the early days when Spillian built up its first repertoire. Energy Groove and Music Matters presents People and Music. Now, obviously, Stranger Than Fiction means a lot to you. You named your memoir uh, after yeah, it. Yeah, actually, that was Bob Gillies. Idea. He said, "Call it Stranger Than Fiction." Tell us about the writing of the memoir. Well, that was like a that was like a cerebral vomit. I was soon to be starting at APRA. I had ten weeks, and I just I don't know. I just sat down and spewed it all onto this <laughs> one of those old. What do they call the computers that weren't real ones? Clones. I think they're probably illegal. Computers that look like IBM, whatever's, but they came out of Taiwan. Oh, right. Clones. Okay. Yeah, I had one of those. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so if it had blown up, that would have been the end of the book. But, yes, yeah, so... And it was probably meant to be, because also I interviewed the guys that had been in the band in Melbourne. Tim, Neil, Eddie, Noel, Wally, all that. And my house was burgled, and the, the DAT tapes were sitting there with all the CDs. I, I don't know why, but the burglars took all the CDs and left this pile of DAT sitting there all on their own. <laughs> <laughs> so the book was able to be finished. Yeah, right. I just, I like telling stories. And also, it's just a great story to tell. So it's kind of wrote itself, really. Yeah, and how did the other band members feel about being written about? Oh, well... I don't really know. See, I wrote about the band. Someone said, oh, you don't, didn't say much about the characters. Mm. And I thought, well, if I did say everything I knew about the characters, there could be some really grumpy people around me. And it's more about the flow of the unit yeah. of what happened on day one. And then, and also, of course, halfway through, or slightly before halfway, I've gone. So I had to just try to make it a bit seamless. Yeah. So I was writing about those years that wasn't there. But the guys told me, I mean, I think that it's an accurate journey that's been told. And how, how is it seeing a project continue on without you? Well, I, I was, I left the band because of a phobic disorder, mm. agoraphobia. And so as much as I tried to stay there, I was lucky I had a father that was a doctor. And I'd say to him, oh, Jerry, that's his name, Jerry. I get nervous, you know, because actually in the, when I was in the band, I didn't know what it was. I, I thought I was mad from taking LSD. I thought, you know, I thought, oh, I've lost my mind. I'm one of those suckers, those casualties. So, But he, he said, oh, you've probably got stage fright here. You should take these. So they're called Serapax, benzodiazepines. So every morning I'd take half one, every night I'd take one. And I managed to ward off reasonably well panic attacks, which... Uh, I found so bad that I it would will my own death occasionally. I just want to die. But in the end, even though you know, I got to go around the world twice and go all over the places, and I loved all those the guys I was with and loved the music. In the end, the phobia just forced me to to leave, and so that's why I left the band in '77. I assume that's the most challenging aspect of being in in a band like that? Well, being in a band really is like starting your, your own business. Mm. Someone the other day said to me, what's the point in being in a band? Who's going to hire you? And I said, well, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. They're not hiring us. What they're really doing is deciding to purchase our product. We are forming a company. Mm. We may as well be a washing machine company, who's going to buy our washing machine? So who's going to come to the show? Who's going to buy the record? Mm. But the work that was involved from the from wanting to be a Beatle as, a, as this thing in the mind to actually standing on stage in San Francisco and getting a standing ovation halfway through the set when we played Another Great Divide, I did think, well, all of that work be put in. I mean... And everyone that's listening that has been in the band knows that everything rests on your shoulders. It's mm. not like someone comes and says, uh, OK, well, um, you know, I'm the foreman and, you, you know, I mean, I guess you do have managers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But still, you don't exist until you forge that identity. Mm. And that was one band 
that put in a huge amount of work. And I guess if you look, if you go through the book, you can sort of see that really. That that's really what I was trying to say in the book, or did say in the book, was that we put a lot of effort into that. And so anyone that you know, like my parents and my my mother's in the next room. I hope she can't hear me. But her <laughs> friends would say to her, you know, Michael's got an engineering degree, and he's trying to be a pop star. Surely that's a waste of a life. So, because this this is like 40 years ago or something. So yeah, we had to deal with all that, and so did they. But they were supportive of every move we ever made. So your family was really supportive of you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think deep down. My father, who was more of a poet than a doctor, and my mother, who's where I got my love of showing off, I think they sat in the audience at the speeding shows and thought, yeah, hey, this is great, this is good. Imagine being, imagine being up there doing this sort of stuff. So they were very supportive. Energy Groove and Music Matters presents People and Music. Tell us about the Citizen Band. After well, so, you know, well, just to explain the agoraphobia thing, agoraphobia is a fear of not being able to get back to where you feel safe. Mm. That's probably the best summation of, of what lies behind it. Okay. I was safe in Auckland. So day to day in Auckland, I eventually worked out I didn't need to take the tranquilizers. But the minute I got in the car and started to drive out of town, I would be fearful. So I came back from Chicago after the last American tour dates in 77 hit Auckland and I thought oh, oh, oh I feel quite good <laughs> mm. I feel okay I still didn't know what I had but the disorder was or anything and my brother was here and I I felt bad because I just suggested to his that they steal Nielsen from the band he was in with my brother Jeffrey <laughs> and he had some songs he had the song called Julia a few other songs and I, and I said well you've got some great songs and I didn't think enough about it I suppose about the future but yeah so we started learning them hired one of the greatest New Zealand drummers ever Brent Eccles mm. and beautiful lead guitarist Greg Clark and we became a band and two years later we were playing to 1800 people in Milton Town Hall and two albums out and off we go to Australia well of course uh, I get to Australia and go oh shit here <laughs> I am again <laughs> taking tranquilizer and, yeah. was, and it just became too much but that's how it came about because I think my brother's a great little songwriter, and uh, so, so again, the love of songs. Also, I better declare this, I am not a songwriter. Mm. I've tried, and I find it to be one of the hardest things I've ever had to try to achieve in my life. And he was the drummer in Spread Ends in the, in the first shows that really took off. Yeah. And we were a great, I thought, um, rhythm section then. Uh, I don't know why he left it. He left the band. But then we came back to get to the Citizen Band, but he was out front, mm -hmm. guitar, vocals. But great songs. Again, it's, you know, it's the songs you've got to play to people that excite the people. So it was really organic then? Very. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a calculated thing. It just, but unfortunately, my disorder, once she started touring, it started to really smash me around. Really. And in the end, I had to just leave and live in Auckland. Now, you obviously feel very passionately about the local music industry um, and homegrown New Zealand music as well. Uh, what, what are the driving factors behind your desire to, to nurture local music? Well, I just think it should have its pride of place. In 2003, my family, Richard and I and our four children, went to Europe lived, to live for six months just because it was the right time to do it. Mm. We had six weeks in Ireland. Well, the minute you get off the friggin' plane in Ireland, you get the sense that their original musical scene of this society is on a par with the sporting scene. Right. It's on a par with politics. So it's likely to hear on the Irish six o'clock news a story about an incredible new success and young people who are writing songs up in Galway Bay or you know something like this mm. as opposed to who's won the Gaelic football competitions and things like that and I came back here it was such a contrast I thought we have to be like Ireland we have to have on the beach in summer we've got people throwing cricket balls at each other or doing this or doing that we need people sitting around in circles playing songs with the guitars or ukuleles or 
whatever, someone walking down the road with a tin whistle that's blowing on it, someone with a guitar on their back. Mm. We need, because New Zealand is, um, is, is with every nation, still one that adores songs, still has great respect and pride for the New Zealand songs that come through with its local artists, uh, and yet they, they all think they can't do it. There's this weird hangover from Queen Victoria, seen and not heard, and so if I say to someone, oh, you know, why don't you and I, let's just sing a song right now. They go, oh, I can't sing. And I say, why not? Oh, because, you know, I've never been able to sing. And I say, what sport do you play? They might say golf. And I say, what were you like on your first game? And if I say, oh, uh, it was about 20 shots on every hole. And I say, well, you were no, no good then. What made you want to keep going? So it's that weird thing in New Zealand society, especially that sporting pursuits, but also physical pursuits. If you go to the waterfront, there's about 1,500,000 people on, on cycles screaming up and down. Schools also, I think the thing with schools is that I think that's where things should start, but they don't. So to get some of the kids will say, students who are being picked for songs to be recorded on the CD will email and say, oh, the school won't let me take the day off to record it. But they'll give them a week off to go to a rowing tournament. Yeah, isn't that odd? That is extremely odd. And yet in the sporting world, if you go to watch my old school Sacred Heart play Auckland Grammar, mm. that's a religious experience, which I completely back. I'm there too. I just wish it would also, that intensity of purpose and enjoyment and celebration and ceremony always translates across to the art. People and Music on Energy Groove. Well, say five or six, seven years ago, the whole thing of LimeWire or whatever they were called and all of that, I'm getting it for free, it was very prevalent with my children who were probably aged about 15, 16, 17 and 18. Yeah. Now they're in their mid-20s, late-20s, very happy to buy whatever they want. Mind you, they're also doing Apple Music and Spotify, but just to go to those that want to be part of the performing world, not the listening world. My son Barney is 25, has in a band called Dictaphone Blues, and I've been to see them play, and things like this, and I think, oh, yeah, you know, I can't envy him up there. And so. But he, we had a chat the other day, he said, you know, I know all about what happened with you guys, and I just don't know how we, a band today, can do the same because everything is so fragmented. See, when Spinning started out, we, we never got radio play, but we did get TV play, and there was one channel, and the entire country watched it. Mm. And there weren't many bands. Not many people in the early 70s, mid 70s, started bands, but now, Barney is one of a billion, because everyone's having a go. Yeah. But you're up against sport on TV on nighttime. You're up against cafe society. Uh, and people have so much choice in what music to listen to, whether it's recorded music or live music, mm -hmm. but mainly recorded, that for someone like Barney's band to have an impact, it's, he, you know, I, I, they're finding it very hard to work out how to do it. Well, for the listener, it's a perfect world almost. It is. When, when <laughs> I think back to what I had at his age, 1977, probably about 40 albums or 50 albums. Well, now he can bring into his life 40 or 50 new albums every day. Mm. But I wonder if there's a blip, you know, like when it starts. In this country, probably late 60s with the formula through to the mid-90s, mm. a peak of where listeners came to live shows. But now, like we, that when we go and see Barney, there are probably about 100 people in the room. Live music is where it's at, but not a lot of people seem to go. So we were lucky, like Citizen Band, we were part of that great wave, just as you did in your era, when you had Midnight Oil, The Angels, mm. Cold Chisel, Early in Excess, etc. That was a glorious era of people going to see bands in bars. 
part of it was the technology, so that all of a sudden PA systems were really cool and you went to see a band and they whacked you on between the eyes. <laughs> Two, we didn't have sport on TV, we didn't have cafe society. You either stayed at home and watched shit on TV or you went out to a bar to watch a band. Yeah. So we'd be playing to like 800 people in a bar. I don't think any bar would get 800 people today. Mind you, the festival culture is quite big here. Yeah, and actually, same here. Yeah. So it's more of a running away from home at the age of 18 or 17 or something and camping for three days. Mm. Yeah, no, that, I mean, each one has its say, but they certainly, every summer, there are a lot, quite a lot of three or four festivals to go to. People and Music on Energy Groove. Tell us about your time as Director of New Zealand Operations for, for APRA. What were the circumstances that led you to that role? I ended up being the guy running Sony Music Publishing for Mike Lading. He was the managing director here at Sony. Oh, right. Okay. And he'd also been the financial director of CBS Records, which became Sony, yep. when Citizen Band was on that label. So we had a, a nice connection. And while I was there, I spoke at a seminar. I spoke about publishing and all this to a bunch of singer-songwriters and musicians and everybody. But Brett Cottle was there, and he talked about APRA. And I took a real shine to him. And then I was at a conference that Dennis Hanlon was putting on for the Sony people in the Hunter Valley. Mm. Won't go into the details of how much he spent. But there where I was, and I thought, oh, I'll go and visit Brett, because I want to find out what's happening with APRA in New Zealand, because... And I don't want to urinate over the old office, but there were certain frustrations that I would have and other people had with machinations of the New Zealand office, which was in Wellington. And so I went to see Brett and I said, Hello, Brett, how are you? And he said, I'm good, how are you? I said, I'm good. And I said, Now, what's happening? I want to talk about the APRA office in New Zealand. And he said, Listen, before you start, we're moving the office to Auckland and the managing director will be staying in Wellington, so, you know, things will change. And I said, so who are you going to put in in Auckland? He said, well, funny you should ask. And I would say within 30 seconds, he'd ask me, and I'd say yes to applying, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> applying <laughs> for that role. I think he, and this is very much my philosophy now, after being kind of an organisation since 1992 when I started, mm. Is that it's a bit like a football team, a rugby team. Say the coach for the All Blacks, he doesn't have to have been one of the greatest All Blacks of all time, but he has to have played the game. Mm. And I think if he, if he wanted someone running APRA New Zealand who had played the game, who'd been on stages, made records, understood that a songwriter in New Zealand, it's their heart as much as their head mm. that you have to consider and he said to me I want happy members and I thought right I can do that and off I went. Now tell me how did your experience on the ground as a musician assist you throughout those 12 years that you were with APRA? Oh I think it, it just felt like home you know so everyone I talked to doesn't matter whether they were 75 like Garner Wayne the old country singer or whether it was a 16 year old or how old was she? She was 19 and Beck Runger walked in mm. from Christchurch to find out about APRA. I just, it just felt like sitting down with somebody just talking about the bands they're in and what's happening out there at the moment. And, you know, I had a bass guitar in my office signed by Paul McCartney and they said, oh, is that Paul McCartney? Said, yeah, that's Paul McCartney. <laughs> it was just this great linkage because I knew what they were either trying to resolve or that whole bright eyed and bushy tailed. I've got my whole future ahead of me. Can you explain a few things here? Yeah, so it just it felt like being part, all part of the same family. Now, in, in 2002, in the Queen's Birthday Honours, you were appointed an Officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services yes. to music, which is very exciting for you. How does it feel oh. to have your contribution to music recognised like that? You know, I don't know where these things come from. <laughs> really? I got another one last Christmas called The Companion. Congratulations, there you Which go. is the next one up, yeah. And someone said to me, well, how did that happen? I said, I've got no idea. <laughs> what happens is you get a personal and confidential letter 
from the honours office asking you if you would accept it. And so I thought, well, you know, you get this cool medal and a badge, but you get to go into the government house and meet the Governor General and have a few drinks and have a dinner and get a bit pissed. Lovely. And it, it kind of just... It also, I think there must be something inside the corridors of Parliament that lie behind it. And I think it's quite important, for, especially for the Planet Strange world, to be understood in government. One, well, that's the main one, understood why we do what we do, yeah. but also to celebrate the successes. So there have been some that have come through, like on our first year, the first CD had Kimber on it, she was 14. Mm. Anna Mack, who had a big top 10 hit here recently. Uh, there's Graham Candy, who's killing them all over in Germany at the moment. Jesse Sheen in London. Eden Spence in California. Louis Baker, who's doing all sorts of things around the place. Tomston and Georgia and Broods. She was on our CD. So it's great because we've been going long enough now for some of them to be, I guess, grown ups. And in government, we make sure they know about this as, as not something that sort of falls over but does catapult some people into the nether regions. Mm. People and music on Energy Groove. Now, if someone wanted to, uh, I guess, follow in your footsteps in a way or at least get a foot in the music industry, whether they're a songwriter, whether they're a musician, or maybe they want to work behind the scenes in the music industry, um, is there any advice that you can give to someone like that? What would you say are the most important values or skills that you would need to, to make a good start in the music industry? Well, I think it's a people game. It's a people game. Every step of the way, there's somebody in front of you that will say yes or no. You know, so it's not like being an archaeologist, really, where you go out and you dig, and it's, so it's, it's then you're on your own. Every step of the way, there's somebody there. So you have to sell yourself. You have to go and ask questions. You have to bug people. I mean, I learned a lot when I was running Mushroom Records back in the early 80s for Mike Gadinsky. Mm-hmm. And there was this one kid that bugged the hell out of me. He had these demo tapes, and he'd ring the next day, oh, Mike, yeah, just making sure you got that demo. And the next day, what do you think of that demo? So what do you think? Bug, 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 bug. And <laughs> uh, what's his name? Russell Crowe and I, I I watched Romper Stomper and I, I remember watching it thinking it's no wonder one day and he had a single he was called Russell Rock he was out at West at a high school out West Auckland yeah and he had a song um, I just want to be like Marlon Brando and it came true <laughs> and ever since then I've said to anybody because I get asked quite a lot and I always say yes oh, I've got all these plans or I'm curious or whatever I'd like to talk to you about you know hmm. being rich and famous or whatever I want to be I'll always meet them and I now sort of sorted out all these questions to ask them and in the back of my mind it's always will they be like Russell Crowe <laughs> will they hammer the shit out of me <laughs> and, I, and if they do I don't mind because it's you know he was amazing well look it certainly shows you they're serious at least <laughs> god yes <laughs> Now, the Music Matters campaign is a global campaign to reinforce the importance of music in our lives. Um, just on a, a final note, how important is music to your life? Obviously, oh, it's very important. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I'm a family man. Uh, but, see, music is the one thing where there's no, there's no downside. If something doesn't engage me, I find that's fine, you just move on, there's no downside to it. So music is the great celebration of life, I think. And one, and two, I find it mysterious because I can't write them, and so when I listen to something like, I mean, my favourite Tim Vincent song would be Stuff and Nonsense, Mm. and I play it on the piano, and I think, well, wait a minute, it's actually not a lot different to Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Who couldn't write that? You could write that, I could write that, but we don't. And he did. And Eddie Vedder goes on stage and sings stuff and nonsense. So mm. it's the beauty of simplicity that I love about songwriting. And so having songs to carry with you. And there are the ones that, you know, because I think so, being at a boarding school, someone like me, I just despised every second of it. So there were songs that saved me, like The Beatles' We Can Work It Out. I mentioned that before. If I'm ever down, 
you know, if I go down and I play week and week it out, I come up again. And that's the power of song. Yeah, I think like I'm I'm in the same boat in the fact that I'm not a songwriter whatsoever. I'm not even a musician, to be honest. But uh, I find music fascinating in the way that it can actually, I don't know, it has this, it can have this physical effect on a person. Truly, absolutely. Well, I went to the Led Zeppelin show in 1972. That seemed to have quite a physical effect on everybody. <laughs> we went mad. <laughs> I think you know it's, it's the it's the weaving together of two completely disparate elements. So you've got words, and we, you know, depending what you listen to, which country you're in, but words, we know what they are. Mm-hmm. So you know, and you and you know that I love you here and now, not forever. Music that those songs are weaved into. What is music? I think it's so mysterious. Isn't it though? That it fascinates us, but we don't want to know why. I think there's a mystery to it. And so this this literal conglomeration of words with this fabric of music together means that those words will live in our hearts and minds forever. Whereas on their own, they probably wouldn't. I mean, there's no poetry FM, is there? So think- why, why isn't there a poetry FM? Why isn't there a station when you can hear people reciting words it's because we need the music Mike. we need the music therein lies the rub <laughs> on that note we'll have to leave it there but it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you Mike that's great